And welcome Hoosier fans to another victorious episode of Doing the Work, the first show on the Back Home Network dedicated to covering IU women's basketball. And today is our 114th episode overall, recorded on Monday, March 25th of 2024. I'm your host, Kathy Amos, joined today by my special guest, Andy Bottoms. And today we will break down your number fourth seeded Indiana Hoosiers 68-75 win over the Oklahoma Sooners to get them to another Sweet 16. That is also bringing the record to 26-5. and five. But as usual, we will start our show how we start every show, and that's with our Hoosier Proud banner moment. And for me, I'm going to take actually a string of events that happened pretty late in the game with around 117 left in the game. Matt goes down and has a layup for two. And then we go back down on the other on defense. Sydney has a great defensive rebound. We go back down to McKenzie, who was fouled, makes both of her free throws, and he gets it tied 64-64. And then we force an Oklahoma turnover. Then Mac goes back down for another two and then another Oklahoma turnover. That made it 64 66. Um, finally, we had Girls On pull up for a, a short range two and force yet another Oklahoma turnover. And then finally, Sarah Scalia gets the line with two free throws, and that seemed to seal it for us at 64 70. And then Sarah would go on to knock down a few more free throws. So um, I'm stringing all of those together for my ba banner moment. And the reason I'm doing that, because it was um, definitely a lot of McKenzie mentioned in all of that, but I think it was a team effort that got us over this, over the hump, if you will, <laughs> in this game um, to, to, you know, in a game where we, you know, we'll talk about it, but boy, our shooting was just not there. Oklahoma was very, very physical with us. And we just seemed out of sorts from the beginning, but the team did what they needed to do. And that last one minute and 17 seconds, seconds and they really showed why they could come together and were a veteran team. And for me, that's why I strung all of those together for our Hoosier Proud Banner moment because I thought that whole sequence of event really sealed the game for us. And as always, our banner moment is brought to you by Homefield Apparel, the presenting sponsor of the Back Home Network. Um <clears throat> excuse me. Um this also includes Assembly Call and the Crimson Cast. So Cheers to all of you if you were uh, in Galen's live watch party and now jumping over to us. Happy to have you with us. But that was a lot of fun. Um, but Homefield is uh, is the Back Home Network's presenting sponsor. So they are constantly releasing new schools or updating their products for schools in their existing lines. So you're bound to find something for you or anyone in your life that just loves great collegiate gear. Not only do you get great quality apparel, but you are supporting an Indiana-based business that has its roots in the Kelly School of Business. So go to homefieldapparel.com and use our promo code HOME23 to get 15% off if it's your first time ordering. Again, that home that banner, excuse me, that promo code is HOME23 for 15% off. And the website is homefieldapparel.com. We're one for the team. All right, Andy. Well, with that, um, clearly I'm not on my game tonight either. Um, let's kick it over to you for your bottoms line. Um, what, what are your thoughts on today's game? Uh, it's understandable. The game took an emotional toll. You're recovering. It's fine. It's uh, it's fine. No, I, it, uh, I I much more enjoyed the game um, from Saturday that we got to do together. There was a little bit less suspense in that one by the second half. And, um, it, you know, I talked for a second before we got started here. It, it definitely felt like the team was seeing ghosts a little bit from the, the Miami game last year, really kind of pressing and, and took some bad shots, dug a hole with some, a, a run of, of poor defense early in the second half. And, you know, the game kind of threatened to get away from him there. They clawed back, got back in at that point. And then, you know, Oklahoma gets that and one to make it 64 to 60. And I know that this is the, the spot that you talked about in the banner moment, but from that point forward, I you scored on every single possession from there till the end of the game. And outscored Oklahoma 15 to four uh, to end it. And I think that's what you look for in a team that's a, a, a group of, of veterans who have been through a lot, been through a lot together uh, to be able to pull together in those moments. It felt like they might not, quite honestly, for uh, for a little bit there. But I, I really thought I, I really thought that stretch, you know, kind of shows what you've come to to know and love about this team and, and that they were really able to rally together. It all started with those six straight points from Mac to take the lead back. Uh, and then everybody else just finished it out from there. And and so uh, I, I think there's a lot of uh, nits to pick in this game with some of the, you know, the the issues that they had 
at different points, but uh, when it really mattered uh, for as, as poorly as they had played offensively in, in large stretches of the game uh, beyond that, they scored uh, 1.45 points per possession in the fourth quarter. They scored 29 points in 20 possessions. I think there might've only been five where they didn't score at all. Uh, so when it really came time to execute down the stretch, they did just a phenomenal job of doing that. So uh, that's certainly an exciting part to linger on. I'm sure we'll get to all the things that maybe didn't go as well as uh, as we thought, but uh, this is a team that rose to the occasion when it really mattered there down the stretch. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that is something we've seen of Coach Moore and teams, not just this year, but, you know, it's a part of that culture. I think she's really established as the, the head coach of our Indiana program here. And um, <clears throat> I think with that, Andy, why don't we just jump right into pivotal plays and maybe, you know, it is hard for me outside of um, – <laughs> what we we saw in that fourth quarter to say what was really pivotal in this game because there didn't seem to me to be one particular play in any of the other quarters that was just like you know what that's it you know it's really going to go our way or it's really going to go Oklahoma way it was really a lot of back and forth but um why don't you go first what kind of um plays just jumped out to you whether we can call them pivotal or not who cares <laughs> Yeah, I, I think there were a number of times that Sydney Parrish really seemed to get key baskets when they were really needed one. Uh, and we talked a little bit after the game against Fairfield that she didn't score a ton and uh, you know, neither of us was concerned with it at that point. And, and she really stepped up in a number of places today. Uh, I think there's about a play a quarter that I marked down at least uh, where she was able to. Uh, you know, where she was able to to make some big plays, hit a three early on to to get herself going, drew multiple offensive fouls. I think she drew her first of I think she might have drawn at least three, maybe four offensive fouls, drew a charge right after that to kind of get things sparked. And then you know, even in the second quarter, they were really struggling to put the ball in the basket. She was able to drive and get it inside. Um, and and after that huge run from Oklahoma in the third quarter, she got to the free throw line, only hit one or two, but was really assertive. Uh, and, and got there. So I thought I thought she had a way of making timely plays and being aggressive when they needed somebody to be aggressive most. Uh, and it was a great bounce back game uh, from her overall. So those are at least a few of the plays that um, that stood out in my eyes for her. Yeah, absolutely. I thought the same thing. I think Sydney kind of disappeared a little bit on us in the third quarter, but she had a fantastic, I thought, first half and then really came back in that fourth quarter and was very aggressive, you know, um, had some, even though they might have been called um, fouls, but they looked like really good defensive stops and blocks and just really some fantastic rebounding from her as well. Um, <clears throat> you know, almost actually she didn't lead the team in scoring. She had eight rebounds um, to um Chloe Moore McNeil, who had nine. So yeah, overall, I thought Sydney had a, had a good, a really a nice game as well. Um, let's, yeah, maybe we'll go about it this way and we'll talk more about just overall play instead of pointing out too many. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many, again, too many um, plays are to, to write down. Um, but I want to talk maybe a little bit about Sarah. I thought Sarah, you know, she struggled like did everyone from the, the three point line. Well, just shooting in general. Um, so Sarah, had one of five from three-point land and only two of seven from the field, but she really came through when we needed her again in that fourth quarter, showing that emotion that you and I talked about on Saturday. And she was really clutch going down the end with those free throws to seal it. So clearly they wanted the ball in her hand at the end when Oklahoma was going to be fouling. And um, it, it paid off with her going seven of eight um, from the free throw line. But I thought that, you know, what I would have liked to see more from Sarah. So you tell me um, if you agree with this or not. When the three-point line wasn't there and they really were running her off of it and she wasn't going to do it, we've seen Sarah this year be more aggressive, go into the basket to try to make plays that way. And we started to see that more from her in the fourth quarter, but I would have liked to seen that probably earlier on in the game when it just wasn't there from her for outside. But what are your thoughts in general about that comment and about Sarah's play in general? Yeah, I feel like she had one drive early and she didn't get a call and then she went away from that just a little bit. I, I think uh, Oklahoma was pretty physical with her defensively, really was grabbing on a lot of the screens that she was trying to go around. But I felt like there were times that she fell into something similar that a, a lot of them did where not, not hard cuts, just kind of movement for the sake of movement, but not really moving to get open. Uh, it felt like at times and a lot of plays devolved into you know some one-on-one -on -one plays at the end, multiple times where – people lost track of the shot clock and some of those things, just the offense just wasn't very crisp uh, from a movement standpoint. I think she fell into that as well. She wasn't alone uh, in that by any means. And and so I thought, you know, she got some open looks that she would normally make 
Um, and and I, I agree with you. She got fouled the one time going to the basket, and then most of the rest of her free throws were just to ice the game. Um, but I thought she she didn't really force shots. So I think you know, there's there's an element to that. I right. think that's something that we talked about a little bit with Sydney in the game on, on Saturday. Um, certainly different scenarios and, and all those kinds of things. But I didn't feel like she was shooting – just to get shots up and uh, and try to spark things. So not, definitely not one of her better games. I think um, the way they defended her was tough. And, and to your point, they were really trying to stay up on her and not give her three-point shots. And, um, you know, at times she, you know, struggled to get to the basket if she wanted to, to go that route as well. So definitely stepped up in the fourth quarter when it mattered the most to, to be able to get to the line and score. But uh, on the heels of her game uh, on Saturday, you know, a bit of a, a step back for, for one game. But – I think we talked about it after that game as well. You've got so many good scores on this team that you can afford an off night for one of them when they may not have it going in, in a certain way and other people will step up. And that was uh, Sydney in particular tonight. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, <clears throat> uh, all right. Another person I thought maybe we we should touch on from our starters is um, Yarden. So Yarden really struggled um, from the field in particular. In fact, I, I, that is one of the pivotal plays that I re- wrote down was that um, Yarden didn't get her first field goal until sometime late in the third quarter. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Actually, it was late in the fourth quarter. She made her first field goal at six minutes left in the game. Um, and she ended up though, you know, with, uh, seven points for us, but three of those points came from the line. So she ended up getting two. And again, this is, I don't know if, you know, if you heard Jeff or I, we kind of dubbed her a little bit of fourth quarter yard in. So, uh, I think we saw that a little bit from her tonight. Normally it would be her draining threes. That wasn't the case, but she had a couple of nice pull up twos where I'm glad that she didn't just go away from her shot and completely, you know, even after being 0 for 8, I think she was before she finally hit that shot or 0 for 7, somewhere in there. Um, she didn't she didn't shy away from it and she still tried, right? And she was still out there giving everything she could. Again, to your point with, with Sarah, she wasn't necessarily forcing things per se. It, she just couldn't seem to finish things today. Um, but I thought Yarden gave us some nice minutes. Um, away from some of her offensive production, you know, she did have five assists as well and a, a nice block shot, which we had, we'll talk about the blocks. I'm sure when we get to the numbers, but um, defensively, I thought Yarden was okay too, um, are pretty good for us today, but overall, you know, not a strong, strong performance from Yarden, but again, making, you know, the, her seven points in that fourth quarter when we got to crunch time um, is something that we've kind of expected from her, but uh, any overall thoughts on Yarden and what you kind of saw from her today? Yeah, I missed a lot of shots right around the basket that I think she would normally make. I think that's a comment you could probably make about the team as a whole, particularly in the first half. It seemed like they had a lot of shots rim out. Mac missed some shots that she would normally make. It felt like uh, inside. And, and they really, for a stretch in the third quarter, were trying to post her, post Yarden up quite a bit. Um, and, and McKenzie, it was, there was a stretch there where that's really all they were doing was trying to get them the ball. And I think there was a, a one of the times she just, I don't even think, realized the. Um, the shorter guard for um, I'll get the name here. So I don't just uh, totally blow it, but um, the, the, the tot, the shorter guard for Oklahoma, they were trying to post her up and like Yarden had the ball. It's just like, just turn around. You're a foot taller than she is and, right, and right. lay the ball. And I think she turned around and missed a shot, got the rebound, missed a shot again, um, got an offensive rebound where she missed a putback that was right, right around the basket. And so I think just struggled to finish. I don't know what, if there's any one thing you can, uh, you know, attribute that to, you know, she definitely doesn't look as comfortable in the post uh, as, as I think they talked about wanting to do that more with her over the course of the year that hasn't materialized a ton. Um, And I Mm -hmm. think that part of it is just being able to kind of recognize where she was and that she had time. She had such a big advantage. It didn't really matter what she did. And and she just kind of rushed things in there. So um, interesting the way that they used her didn't, you know, only took a couple threes out of her 10 shots, um, but got in the mid range, made some shots. The, The first basket she hit was off, you know, some really good ball movement, some of their best of the game uh, yeah. in the fourth quarter. And that's really where they started to pass the ball a little bit better and, and have some success that way. And then um, the other one I think was around the free throw line, but that was when they switched to the terrible camera angle that you couldn't actually right. tell what was going on. So <laughs> I saw the ball go in. I saw her shoot it where she shot it from. I can't exactly say, um, but you know, I, I think with her and, and I think that's the case with a lot of them. If, if you can get one to go in early, it makes such a big difference for her. And right. she really struggled to do that. Um, did make those free throws at least in that, you know, got fouled back to back possessions in the, in the second half posting up. So, uh, yeah, a little bit of an uneven game from, um, from her, but I thought she was still impactful on the defensive end, uh, where she could be, 
rebounded all right, had some nice assist numbers, as you said. So found other ways to contribute, uh, even when she wasn't, uh, even when she wasn't shooting it that well. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, <clears throat> So overall with this game, I, I didn't, you know, often we see a run one way or another or both team will, you know, go for a run, but we really didn't have that. I think the most that we saw was when at one point um, towards the end of, I believe the third quarter, right before the media timeout in the third quarter where we had to call a timeout, um, Oklahoma hit back-to-back threes on transition and they extended their lead 45 to 38. Um, that was about the biggest run I think we had of the game was in that kind of area. So it was a really tightly contested um you know, match between us. And we came out after that media timeout and Sydney hit a free throw. Chloe Moore McNeil had a steal. She had a pull up jumper. Then we had another defensive stop and then Mac had another bucket. And then we had a nice little five Oh run to get right back into it. So, you know, it was, I thought that sequence of event was also pretty pivotal because it was kind of a danger time, right? Like we were down seven now at home, had to call that timeout, which, you know, coach Moran typically doesn't like to call timeouts until fourth quarter, especially right before a media timeout is coming up. So I thought that was a really great, you know, use of the timeout coming out uh, from it and really turning that back around. So I thought that was a nice pivotal sequence, but, um, have any other plays Andy written down that you want to talk about, or do you want to jump into numbers? No, no, I think I'll just piggyback on what you said a little bit. I mean, that stretch there, Oklahoma scored on, I count this up here, seven straight possessions in that, in that little stretch there before IU took the timeout and IU was managing to, you know, get a, you know, Mac and, and Yarden scored a little bit in there, whether it was making, you know, one or two from the line just to kind of stem the tide a little bit. But that was really when Oklahoma got out in transition a bit more, was able to kick the ball up, play the way they wanted to get quick shots. I you struggled to get back uh, and organize defensively at times during that stretch and really, um, really let Oklahoma get pretty comfortable in that stretch. And and what's funny is, and, and looking through, you know, the stats, they scored all those points in that one stretch of the third quarter. Outside of that in the third quarter, they scored three points. Um, it, it was just that one flurry there where IU was able right. to withstand it a little bit, get that, like I said, Sydney just made an aggressive move, got fouled. Uh, you talked about Chloe making the that little jumper there um, on the baseline, I think, and were able to kind of just stem the tide a little bit, get back in it, and really got it closed, closed back up by the end of the quarter so that they could – um, enter the fourth quarter in pretty good position. So I think t- to your point, doesn't like to take those timeouts. You're right around when the media timeout would be. But I also think she took the timeout, not, not, you know, maybe a possession or two goes by, then you get the media timeout. And for a team that wasn't getting a ton out of the bench from a production standpoint, at least points wise, and was going to pretty much ride the starters the rest of the game, like getting those two kind of back-to-back breaks there um, while probably not the, the, the sole purpose of the timeout did serve them well to be able to get a breather, uh, relax a little bit and then get back in the game from there. Yeah, that's right. I, I, I had written that down too, that after that media timeout, um, or I'm not sure which timeout, if it was coach Morris or the media, yeah, they only scored three more points in that quarter. So, um, we didn't lock it down defensively as well. So, um, all right, Andy, well, why don't we just go ahead and jump in? We've been talking about it a lot of numbers anyway, so why don't we make it official and um, talk about some notable numbers? So how about from a team perspective, any team stats you want to first uh, lay on us that you want to go over? <laughs> well, one, one of the big things that we talked about after the Saturday game was the assists and and how many assists on made baskets they had. And that really wasn't uh, was not a strength in the first half, at least. I think that spoke to some of the struggles right. that you had offensively. I think they had just six assists on 11 makes in the first half. Then you go to the second half, 12 assists on 14 makes and and eight of nine uh, in the fourth quarter. And I think that was emblematic of the struggles that they had offensively. Once they were able to settle in, move the ball a little bit, um, I obviously dumping it into to Mac was uh, a pretty good way to get assists on the, uh, over the course of the game as well. But I just thought they moved the ball better and settled in. Everything seemed like a struggle uh, offensively there for a while. IU wasn't really getting anything in transition. Uh, and like I said, had those couple possessions, it gets the end of the shot clock and you got the ball in people's hands or in places where there's really nothing they can do with it. Just kind of poor recognition and communication in some, in some cases uh, there. But I really thought when it mattered, uh, they buttoned that up really well and uh, got back to some of the things that helped them be successful on Saturday with, uh, with those assist numbers and couple that with four turnovers for the game, including none in the second half. 
Yeah, that's right. Um, I had written down that too. Four turnovers and we forced 11. A lot of them in that that flurry that, you know, I was kind of talking about in that third quarter in particular where we really came out. And I think that really helped in a, you know, a um, what a seven point game. We had nine points off of their, their 11 turnovers. So not only did we force 11 turnovers, but we turned a good chunk of them into points as well. And so I thought that was really important for us today. Um, that, you know, it wasn't a ton of turn turnovers that we forced, but with as physical as Oklahoma was with us to not have any turnovers on our end to your point with only four, I thought was really good. Um, Another number we should have been talking a lot about on the show, Jeff and I, is um, the total rebounding margin. And while it definitely got better throughout the Big Ten um, conference play, it, it did kind of rear its head again today. So we got out rebounded 48 to 39 in total, and in and, and allowed 17 offensive rebounds for Oklahoma. And that led to 14 second chance points for them. So now we did have eight second chance points of our own, but still that's a six point margin in Oklahoma's favor. And it could have been a, a lot worse actually, but I think they were missing a number of bunnies and, and shots as well. So I think we got pretty lucky there that that wasn't a bigger discrepancy. And again, and it's a seven point game and you're allowing 17 um, offensive rebounds and those many looks again at the basket. That's just something, you know, we've been talking about all year that they have to be quite a bit stronger on as they look ahead to their next opponent. Um, what other numbers, Andy, do you have? Yeah, I thought the rebounding kind of ebbed and flowed over the course of the game. They, they I think even by the first media timeout, they were getting out rebounded by six. Um, we're able to tighten that up by halftime. And then the second half, you gave up, uh, you, you know, gave that up a little bit. Um, you know, if you're looking at team numbers, you want the good. I think 22 of 29 from the free throw line, including 18 of 23 in the second half and 11 of 12 uh, in the in the fourth quarter was uh, obviously clutch to be able to come up with that. Points in the paint evening up at 38 38. Um, yeah, Oklahoma we had 24 in the first half. Um, yeah. and they were getting a lot of easy baskets around the around the rim uh in that regard. So I think that was a good one. Blocks we touched on nine blocks, five steals, couple that with the turnovers. That's a, a you know a strong uh defensive performance. So I think those are the uh those are the positive ones uh as you look at it that way. Um so I'll, I'll, if you got any other positive ones or want to talk about those, we can do that. But I think there's definitely <laughs> some, uh, definitely some not so great ones that we can uh, that we can yes. run down here in a second as well. Yeah, I'll just mention one positive. Um, it was twelve thousand three hundred eighty-five. That was, I think, our sixth sixth man. Um, that is now our crowd for the for the team. They had just um, a, a little over that on Saturday at twelve thousand eight hundred. So again, another really strong showing from our crowd. Um, so yeah, I'm going to mention that because uh, I feel like they need a six a six person player uh, vote here for them. So <laughs> kudos to the crowd for showing up, being loud, and being raucous. And I read somewhere that even out into the parking lot, there was still cheering and celebrating so congratulations to the fans but yeah that's a nice positive number to to throw in there as well i think yep definitely it was uh you know they were during some of the stretches just waiting to explode for for yes. something to go well there was the one where lily had that rebound and kicked it out to sarah like the roof would have come off if she was able to make yes. that and so everybody was just and they finally got it in the fourth quarter and and were really trying to will the team to win and that's why it's important to be able to get these uh, early home games. That was a huge advantage for IU of really being able to uh, to use some of that. And as they got the momentum, and even when they didn't have the momentum, somebody had to pick you up in, in some of those scenarios. So definitely yeah. kudos to the crowd for sure. Yeah. So so speaking of the the missed three from Sydney, um, maybe this is a good way to segment. I and mean, we you know would be remiss if we don't at least run down some of the shooting numbers. So I'll just cover it real quickly, and um, we'll we'll flush it and move on because it's a win. We want to you know dwell on the positive. But you know after shooting um, 32 percent in the the first half, we did improve um, on the field goal percentage. Ended up shooting 38 percent from the field in total. The unfortunate thing for this team is that we were only three of 16 from three point land at. A 19%. The nice thing was that, you know, to stay positive again, Oklahoma was only four of 25. So there was 16% from three. So there was neither team really lighten it up from, from three point land tonight. And Oklahoma ended up shooting worse than us at 35% um, in total from field goals. So, you know, uh, the shooting was not there, but like you and I were talking about already earlier, Andy, they took, they were taking what was given to them. 
And what was given to them was getting it down to McKinsey, you know, and it was not her most efficient night at 12 of 23, but they did what they needed to do to, to get the W um, when it might not have been our prettiest game ever, but they did what they needed. And like you said, they made the free throws and they not just made them, they made them when it really needed to be made down in that fourth quarter. Um, so that's probably this, the worst number we're, um, we probably need to talk about and just uh, mention, but are any other team stats um, that you want to cover? Yeah, I might, I might actually have one well, that's worse. Um, but, you, uh, but, you know, I, I, like you said, I didn't think they forced three pointers. I thought they got a lot of good looks. Some of them were halfway down, uh, just an off shooting night, and and somehow Oklahoma managed to shoot worse, as, as you mentioned. Uh, the bench points, 25 to 1 oh, uh, yeah. out of court on the bench is probably the other one. Now, to be fair, bench didn't get a lot of minutes. You can argue, well, that's a chicken or an egg thing. Did they not get a lot of minutes because they didn't produce, or uh, did they not produce because they didn't get a lot of minutes? Um, but I, you know, I, I just thought I was surprised that Lexi didn't play a little bit more uh, at times. I thought, I thought Lily gave some good minutes, um, but I also thought they were kind of put in situations at one point in the first half. They're both in the game together. Uh, and I think sometimes that can be difficult just where you're, you're limiting your options a little bit offensively of who you really want to get the ball to. So I thought that was one of the, you know, one of the, the downsides. I thought coming off a game where the bench played really well uh, was a bit surprised. And, and Oklahoma – is you know probably going to outscore a lot of teams from a bench perspective. They right. play a ton of people, rotated to, to keep people fresh, and I think that was uh, a big factor in the game for them, especially with some of the rebounding that they were you know bringing in fresh bodies over there. And so um, you know twenty five to one is uh, certainly doesn't sound good. There's no way to to really sugarcoat that, but um, you know I think that's a, a case where as you start spinning ahead to what are you, IU's got ahead of them next you're certainly going to need everybody to have a great performance, including getting some unexpected contributions from people on the bench. So uh, maybe they're saving it up and we'll find that out on Friday. But uh, uh, you know, that was, that was definitely a number that stood out when you run down the stat sheet in terms of uh, what's there. And then fast break points, 15 to two for Oklahoma. Uh, yeah. You know, that was something they really wanted to do. They talked about that a lot on the broadcast. They want to get shots up quickly. And during the stretch where they really uh, rattled off a bunch of points, that was what they were doing. They were getting out in transition, making IU scramble, taking advantage of occasions where people didn't get back. And um, that's a little bit unique to the way they play, I think. So maybe not something that's that's hugely transferable as you look ahead. Yeah, yeah. I think what Coach Morin said in her um, press conference preview of this game was Oklahoma. I can't remember the exact percentage, but a, a, a big percentage of their possessions, they actually are scoring within 10 seconds or less. Um, so they knew it was coming, um, and I, yeah, maybe they sold them down. Um, but how about we end on this last team number? Um, so after Saturday, where we had 10 blocks, we followed that up with another nine block game. And, um, you know, one of our listeners, I said, I wonder how many times we ever had 10 blocks in the game. So he went and looked it up for me. And that Saturday game was only the fourth time ever that we've had 10 blocks or more in a game. And so now we followed that up with a nine block game. So I'm sure that's ranks right up there, hopefully in the top 10 as well. And four of those were from McKenzie Holmes as well. So um, I thought that was really cool to see uh, again, you know, I was expecting, I wasn't surprised with the blocks against Fairfield because we were just so much bigger than them, but Oklahoma had some size and um, you know, they were a very physical team. So for us to be able to put up nine blocks, I thought was a really great number. A, a person who might, might think the officials missed a couple calls on say <laughs> a yard and Garzon block uh against the you know tot driving in or the one that Sydney got called for late. Sydney, you yep. one might say they really had eleven, um, if not for a couple <laughs> foul calls that that robbed us of of those. But nine is good. Just saying yes. there might have been more. Yes, that is actually a very fair point. But Andy, any other numbers you want to hit on or should we uh, look ahead to um, move on to game ball and we can talk individual numbers there? Uh, no, nothing else for me. I no. don't think. All right. Well, let's um, transition over to game ball then. So again, if you are watching on our YouTube feed, um, you can see a scroll at the bottom with our, our numbers, although I'm not sure that I updated it after our last game. So um we now have Sydney, excuse me, McKenzie Holmes with 13, Sarah Scalia with seven. Um, yeah, I haven't updated it. Sorry. Sydney Parrish with four, Yard and Gerson with three, and Chloe Moore with uh, Chloe Moore McNeil with three. So again, Andy, um, I think kind of similar to Saturday when you and I uh, did our broadcast together, I think this is going to be pretty quick and easy, but you know, let's make it official. Who do you have for your game ball? It's always a good time to linger on the greatness of McKenzie Holmes. So there's no, uh, <laughs> No issue with that. I think it was her without a doubt. Ends up with 29 points for the game uh, with six rebounds, 
uh, just one assist, which I think was one of the first baskets that IU made uh, on, a, on a nice pass across to, to Sydney for a three, four blocks and a, a steal in, in that run late, and really just did her absolute best work as the game wore on. Uh, you know, ends up third quarter, gets eight points on three of six shooting. Fourth quarter, she gets 12 points, five of six, plus two of two from the line. And uh, she was really the one who got it done when it mattered most. And, and like I said, I thought she missed some shots early in the uh, in the first half that she would normally make, made some, you, you know, the moves we've all become accustomed to seeing and the ball just rimmed out and wasn't able to finish. So it could very easily have been a 30 plus point game for her. But, uh, you know, she's the one that that refused to let them uh, go quietly, refused to let them lose as the game wore on. And, and she was really uh, the person when the outside shot wasn't falling, they dumped the ball into her. She made things happen and uh, probably not a more fitting way for her to finish her career at Assembly Hall than uh, with a performance like this. Yeah, absolutely agree with that. And lovely to see her going out on such a high note and, and not going out going out from playing in Bloomington, we should say, because they do get to play again on Friday. Um, but one other thing, um, you know, to point out with her is she only had one turnover today, too. Um, and that has definitely been something, you know, we were really getting concerned about um, early on into Big Ten play was how, you know, her feet, we were calling them happy feet. She was getting a lot of happy feet and she'd have four or five turnovers, six turnovers in a couple of games. And she's really cleaned that back up to what we saw a lot from her last year. And so not only did she, you know, get in and make her free throws five of seven, like you mentioned, and uh, 29 points, you know, she had some assists, those rebounds, but I was very happy with only one, one turnover as well today. So um, congratulations to Mackenzie Holmes. That gives her her 14th game ball on the year. All right. So with that, we'll transition over to the Grace Burger Hardest Worker. Um, and again, we have the scroll up, um, although I did forget to update this as well. So um, I guess I'm missing Jeff, where we usually divide and conquer all the, the podcasting duties. But um, we have quite a tie going on between um, a number of people. So Lexi Barker, so Chloe Moore McNeil and Sydney Parrish each have six. And then Mackenzie Holmes, not too far behind with five. Sarah Scalia, Lily Meister, Lene Beaumont, each with two. And Yarden goes on with one. So um, that's where we're kind of landing at right now. Um, but what do you have in, for your um, for your game ball? Or excuse me, your Grace Burger Hardest Worker today. <laughs> I uh, think there's a couple of ways to go, but I think there, um, yeah, there's, a, there's a couple different ones. Um, I, you know, the two candidates to me are, are Sydney Parrish and Chloe Moore McNeil. We haven't really talked about Chloe a whole lot. She ended up right. with nine points, nine rebounds, five assists, uh, and a steal and uh, and just one turnover in uh, her 38 minutes of play. I thought, you know, again, is everything that that we have come to expect from her, made some timely shots, really tried to get people organized um, at, at times, and uh, I, I thought did a good job running the team. I, I'm going to go with Sydney. I just thought that she made a lot of timely plays, as I brought up earlier, made, you know, whether that was drawing charges um, different things like that. You know, she did a little bit of everything as well. Similar to what we saw from Chloe ends up with 17 points, uh, hit two of, I used three threes on the game, eight rebounds and five assists for her as well. Had a couple blocks and a steal. Uh, again, I would argue probably a third block, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, and so I just thought she was got back to doing some of the things that, that we've all come to expect from her. Uh, I thought a really, really solid performance on both ends, made some, uh, good plays drawing, like I said, three or four offensive fouls on uh, on Oklahoma, making some big shots and uh, really being aggressive at times when I, you needed somebody to step up. So I don't think you can go wrong with either one of those. Um, so if you want to say Chloe and leave it to the workaholics, that is uh, your prerogative for sure. I don't think you can go wrong with either one. But I thought a really big bounce back game from Sydney after, um, you know, after not putting up numbers, at least on Saturday, as we talked about. Yeah, I, I think this is a, another good problem the, to be having with this team where it's really hard to decide almost game in and game out who you're going to give all of these various awards to. But I agree with you, Andy. I think it came down to Chloe for me and Sydney as well. You know, and there's definitely a great argument to be made for, for Chloe where she just was a couple, you know, a basket and then one rebound shy from a double-double. 
um, and had five assists as well. Um, but I thought Sydney really showed us some great hustle as well, um, playing 35 minutes. And the thing that I really liked from Sydney was, again, as aggressive as Oklahoma was, she ended up with only three fouls. And, you know, again, something we saw from her earlier this year was her propensity to, to foul. And she's been kind of cleaning that up as well. And, you know, coming off of that foot injury to be able to put up 35 minutes and be as aggressive as she was tonight, I thought was um, really deserving of that Grace Berger hardest worker. So that's who I had written down for mine as well. So um, yes, lots of votes for Chloe out there. And I, I agree um, if we could split it, we would absolutely do that. Um, we, but we will give our game ball today, our Grace Berger hardest worker today to um, Cindy Parrish. And that um, leaps her out front <laughs> by one to lead our count to seven now um, leading the way in our 31 games that we've had so far. Um, so we'll move on just real quick to what we've kind of um, watched record watch. Um, we won't dwell on it a whole lot again today, um, but uh, Mackenzie Holmes had 29 points. And so she now has 2,518 points total. Um, she is um, trailing Calvert Cheney here by 95 points. So um, maybe if we can keep making a, a long run, she still could have a shot at it with um, 30 points coming up. Um, Sarah Scalia is the other person we've been watching. She sh made just one three point tonight. So that made a 101 she's made on the season, which is just an amazing feat. Um, what we're watching is she is now six away from tying Steve Alford for number of threes in a single season. So with that, I think that will tie that piece up. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about what's coming up next, um, Andy. So I'm, I'm quite sure anybody who is watching anything with women's basketball have quite um, understand what's happened. And that is now we will be facing the overall number one seed, South Carolina. Um, that game is going to be on Friday. Um, by ESPN apps that it's to be determined time, but I have seen on the TV where they announced it to be, I believe at five Eastern, um, and, or four central. So I don't have a whole lot of statistics for South Carolina off the top of my head. I'd have to look them up. Maybe I'll go on if I have a little time Wednesday and just give them an in-depth preview, but South Carolina is undefeated this year. Um, last year they did end up losing just one game late into the, the tournament last year as well. Whole new team this year for South Carolina compared to what they had last year, but they really, again, you know, Don Saley just really has put together a nice, a really good team. They're deep, they're physical and you know, the thing I think I know about South Carolina, it's not like Iowa where they have one star with Caitlin Clark that's going to go up and put, you know, 20, 30 points. They're really a well-balanced team. And I think that's why if so many teams are having trouble guarding them because you now have to have all five positions on the floor really ready to guard South Carolina at every one of their positions. So you can't really key in. You can't double a whole lot. And I think South Carolina obviously is that matchup we um, were not looking forward to, but glad that we're going to be having it. Um, Andy, I don't know if you've been able to watch a whole lot of South Carolina. They just demolished North Carolina to get into the Sweet 16. I think they out, I think they won 81 to 41 in that game on Sunday, um, yesterday. But what do you have uh, in your head about South Carolina? Anything you know about them you want to talk about? Uh, I was looking a little bit stat wise. I think your point about their balance is is well taken, and I think part of that is being able to blow a lot of people out. You can very easily play people, but it looks like they got. 10, maybe nine, 10 players averaging at least 15 minutes a game. They've got uh, looks like seven players averaging anywhere between eight points and 13.9 points per game. So just a, a well-balanced group that can impact you in a, or, or attack you in a number of different ways. Uh, and so it, it's one of those where um, probably throw out a bunch of cliches here, but you know, IU really has nothing to lose in this scenario. That's Everybody's right. expecting South Carolina to come out and just roll over everybody that they play. Um, and maybe that happens, maybe it doesn't. Um, but I, I think as you, you look at that, IU can, whereas I, I felt like they played tight at times uh, in the game today, trying to, to exercise the demons of last year and all those things that everybody's been talking about for however long. Like, okay, you're past that now. That's not the concern. Just go out and play loose um, and and see what happens because, um, they, they, you know, this team gets hot. They, they certainly have the ability to, uh, you know, to play with South Carolina. I don't 
not going to sit here and predict that they win and um, anything like that. Their their closest games were a couple here in the SEC tournament. They beat Tennessee by one, beat LSU by seven. Um, just yeah. kind of scrolling back through. There's a lot of a lot of blowouts to be had here. Beat LSU by six in one of their other matchups. Um, and so you know, the other thing about that is if you get get it to a point where hang around, hang around, hang around, put a little bit of game pressure on them. Uh, and see what happens in a situation where they haven't been in a ton of close games. How do they react in those scenarios and uh, and see? But it is a a tall order by any stretch of the imagination. But I think one that I you can go into and, and be able to play a little bit looser than they probably uh, they've probably seen, and we'll have a good game plan, I'm sure, and see if they can uh, execute it from there. And I think you're going to need, uh, you know, we talk about uh, where Sarah is on the three point list. Um, probably going to need her to come pretty close to, to catch him, yeah. uh, you know, to have a big game. And so some of these, some of these numbers that seem like they're a little bit far off, I think those are the kinds of performances you need. You need everybody to, you know, I, I don't think for as much as we've talked about the last couple of games, all oh, this team can survive an off night from this person, that person, whatever, like you got to be hitting on all that cylinders and get some unexpected contributions from, from people uh, coming off the bench. But, but this team yeah. has a bunch of players who've shown they can do that. And, um, I think if you go and research very much about South Carolina, it's probably going to be uh, nightmare fuel to a certain extent. So I would probably keep that to a minimum in the coming days <laughs> if you want to sleep well and uh, figure things out from there. But, um, you know, that th this team is not going to back down from anybody. They've shown that time and time again. So uh, I think that'll be uh, that'll be the key. And we'll see how they come out, get off to a good start, hopefully, and see what happens from there. Yeah, I agree with that. Maybe, maybe I should skip the preview um, solo podcast. Look on enough to feel informed, but not enough <laughs> yes. to be terrified. That's really you got to you got to strike the balance there. That's right. So, yeah, I think that's like a great synopsis there, Andy. And you know, we cannot come out tonight or on on Friday like we did tonight, or even like we did against Fairfield. You know, against Fairfield, that was a pretty tight game going into halftime. We were only up four, and I think a lot of it was we were just not buttoned up on defense. And if we do either one tonight, uh, either one that we had then with the defense – or with our shooting like we had tonight, I think South Carolina is going to punch us in the mouth in that first quarter and it's going to be over in about five minutes. That's, you know, a little bit of what I've seen from South Carolina. But now if we come out like we were against Iowa in that home game um, and are ready to go and we have contributions from all of our starters um, offensively and defensively, you never know. And that's why they play the games. If they, you know, thought that they were just going to, you know, like last year when Iowa beat them, then why would they bother playing the game? They just give South Carolina the trophy and off they would have gone, but um, they still have to get through us. And, you know, we have some talent on this team. Um, we're not as deep. Um, I don't think, and, you know, our talent as, um, but it's, it's really there. I predict we see a lot of our starters. I hope we can get Lexi a little bit more time and Lily's going to have to give McKenzie some rest, but I predict that we're going to see in the upper thirties um, for all five of our starters on this, in this game. I just think that, you know, coach Morin has, has shown she's going to kind of ride those veterans here into the end. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that. Um, like I said, I'm pretty sure that game will be at um, uh, five o'clock Eastern, four o'clock Central. Um, so keep an eye on that, though, in case they change things on us. I would also fully assume it will be on ESPN. Um, but there again, you never know um, with TV and what they're thinking. So just keep an eye on your ESPN app, I guess. Um, but um, I believe I will definitely be back where I'm still verifying for sure if Andy can join me after the game. If not, I'll find somebody else um, who will hopefully be able to join. But one way or another, we will break down that game for you. Um, so speaking of Big Ten, though, we'll just I'll cover kind of quickly what's happened um, for those of you that maybe haven't um, watched outside of Indiana, any of the other um, NCAA tournament games. So as of today, I'll just quickly um, let you know that Michigan and um, Ohio State and Nebraska have all gone down. And so Iowa and Indiana are the lone two Big Ten teams remaining in the Big and the big dance here. And I was playing right now. They are currently up by nine with four and a half minutes in the third. So that's actually a closer game than I, um, some people might've expected, but not surprised with West Virginia. I think the biggest um, concern or the biggest upset in that is obviously Ohio state losing to Duke 63 to 75. I think Ohio state at one point had a 16 or 17 point lead in the first half that they let get away from them. Um, and just kind of unexpectedly took a, took a, a, a nosedive there in that fourth quarter. But um, Andy, 
let's move on and just kind of wrap up and give our final thoughts for today. What would you like to, to leave all of our wonderful listeners with what's on your mind? Well, you know, as we, as we talked about before, I, I'm just happy for this team to be able to come back. I think everybody was uh, from fans to players to everybody. You can say that you're not worried about last year and this is a different season and whatever, but I know I found myself sitting there kind of being like, not again. This cannot happen to this group again. This right. cannot happen to this group again. And kudos to them for for stepping up and being led by the experienced players that they have, like uh, like Mac, like Sydney Parrish, like Chloe Mark Neal, um, like Sarah, being able to drain those free throws. Just you know, the the stars were stars when they needed them the most, and I think that's uh, always the mark of a good team. And so, really glad that they could finish out the undefeated season at home. Uh, and certainly for Mackenzie to finish out her career and, and Sarah in Assembly Hall with the win is really important. Didn't really want to think about coming on here, quite honestly, having to talk about uh, a loss for them. And I'm, I'm just so glad that they came through. And uh, it, it just really speaks to the character and the culture of the program that they that they were able to do that. They just didn't, you know, when it mattered most, they stepped up and made plays time and time and time again. I mean, that's what I go back to down the stretch, you know, down four points midway through maybe further through the fourth quarter and you scored every single time on the on the eight possessions that you had after that like that says a lot about this team and the coaching staff and everybody uh who was able to get them ready so just really excited that uh you know to the extent that one season carries over to another that they exercise the demons from that and now they set up a, a game where you're kind of playing with house money against a team that everybody expects to beat you uh and so I, like i said i hope they come out loose and uh, and firing and, um, they ser- certainly will not be backing down from anybody. I know that's right. So we'll, uh, we'll see what they can do and looking forward to a uh, huge challenge uh, for them on Friday, but, uh, one that I'm excited to see him face. Yeah, I am too. Um, you know, as much as uh, everyone's doubting us, I'm hoping they're getting all kinds of, you know, bulletin board fuel, um, for the locker room and, and putting that up there. And, you know, to your point, Andy, um, it's been a, it's been another really fun and joyous season. And the fact that we now get to carry that over into the second weekend of the NCAA tournament just puts a lot of icing on the cake for us. I think, you know, we're had some struggles like we, you know, we've talked about in the Stanford game and the, the first Iowa game and the Ohio state game and the Illinois game, but then be able to bounce back, you know, and still only have so far five losses in the season, I think is just a great testament again to this, this team and how they don't quit and they take what they, they are given and they really know how to, to finish that, that line, um, cross that finish line and win. And Coach Morin has shown that she's built that with the program too, you know, and, I, and I'm sure we'll have some off-season podcasts talking about the program as a whole and the season as a whole. But I think that I saw this was um, Coach Morin's sixth in um, Sweet 16 appearance now as Indiana's coach. So I, you know, what a great testament to her and, and the program she's built. And, you know, that you can't go on without um, mentioning too, yeah, like the more we continue to play like this in postseason, hopefully the better it will be for our recruiting as well. You know, we get a lot more national coverage and we'll get that national coverage going up against South Carolina. And you never know. Um, that, again, that's why they play the games and we'll see how it goes on Friday. All right. Well, we'll just wrap this up here real quick. Um, What's next as uh, we've been talking about is the Indiana game against um, uh, South Carolina. Again, that game will be on Friday um, evening, early afternoon or late afternoon, depending on where you're at time zone wise. So just double check. Everything doesn't change, Um, but we're expecting that game to tip off at five Eastern and we will have a post game show right after that. So approximately seven Eastern or so. And Andy, if I remember hearing, do you know, is there assembly call radio this week on Thursday? Uh, we had some texts going on about it today. I don't know what we decided. I think there will be a show, uh, at some point there was some discussion of potentially doing it on Wednesday since the, um, sweet 16 games are on Thursday. So, uh, more to come. I don't know that any final decision was made, but it at least been, uh, there's been discussion at least about, about doing something. We're just not quite sure when. 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, keep an eye on that um, out on Twitter and, and Substack if you follow us. So um, so speaking of that, I'll go ahead and wrap it up here. But yeah, if you want to see us do the show live and be part of our live chat, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. We've got over 100 people watching us live right now and, and chatting along with us. So appreciate you all being here. Um, you can be part of our private community as well. You can go to simplycall.substack.com and find out more there about how to do that. A special thanks to John Ringer of Riggs Design for designing our logos. A big thank you to Bob Thompson for our music that you heard throughout the broadcast. And most of all, thank you all that are out there listening to us. We wouldn't be doing it um, just talking by ourselves. So appreciate you actually being there for, for us and joining in. We appreciate that. Um, but we will be back with you again on Friday, still going to talk another game of hoops. But until then, keep your elbow in, your eyes on the rim, and let's go Hoosiers. All right. Well, good deal. Well, thanks again, Andy. Super appreciate it. All right, no problem. Happy to that do it. That was fun. A lot for better some, than uh, doing the Miami game last year. Uh, for sure. There's some good uh, photos out there. Apparently, uh, some of the players went up in the student section again, uh, yes. like they had done before. There's a couple of really good. Now. There's a couple of really really good pictures on Twitter of of Mac. All and right. Them, so, uh, awesome. I'll awesome. Go look awesome up. stuff. Yeah, last year that was pretty rough after that Miami game. I, I was great. You, you, my husband, Sean, and after tonight's game, he looked at me and he goes, whew, you can breathe now. It'll be okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's uh... we, get, we get so invested in our in our teams, right? And then you have to come on and talk about a heartbreaking loss like that after Miami. It was That one was really hard. So I'm glad we didn't have to, to repeat that today. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Not, not ready for this era to end quite yet. So I'm, no. I'm glad. I'm glad to keep no. going. Absolutely. Well, good. Well, thanks again, Andy. I think I'll let you go and get out of here. It's um, check local listings, but getting late, and I want to <laughs> go see what I was doing. I hear they're pulling ahead. So, uh, I heard, yeah, I think it's I think it's tight. At least the last I saw. We'll see. But absolutely. All right. All right. Awesome. Well, thank I'll you let you know about Friday and uh, talk to you later. Thanks for having me again. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Bye bye. Right, see you.